deal a lot with indoor air quality problems, you know, sort of as, um, you know, industry has to some extent, I guess, you know, sort of faded away a bit in terms of heavy industry, at least uh, locally uh, here in New Jersey. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of decades, really, uh, an increase in concerns about uh, indoor air quality, about environmental quality uh, indoors in, in more offices and also people's homes, you know, in other settings, schools especially. So I'm going to talk today about Which of my slides are not advancing. Okay, here we go. Uh, about different uh, sources and types of indoor air pollutants. So give a little bit of a survey and a little bit of an update. Uh, some of these you may be uh, more familiar with. Uh, others are more emerging, newer. Um, we'll talk about some different examples and try to highlight uh, sort of how we can create a framework for looking at indoor air uh, pollutants. Uh, and then we'll talk about the health effects a bit and then about strategies for improving and maintaining indoor air quality. So we spend 90% or more of our time indoors uh, for most people. You know, certainly there's outdoor workers uh, spend more time outdoors, but most of us spend most of our time at home and then some at work, at school, uh, in transportation perhaps, maybe recreational or places of worship or other indoor facilities like healthcare facilities. But especially at home, uh, and we may think, you know, because we pay more attention to our waking hours, that if we spend 40 hours a week at work, that we're spending most of our time at work, but there's actually 168 hours in, in a week, and so 40 hours is less than a quarter of our total time, and generally for most of us, the majority of that three quarters of the remaining time is time at home, and now that people are uh, telecommuting, there's even more time being spent at home for many people. And, and the indoor uh, air quality, the indoor um, air pollution that we might be exposed to can affect our health, but also our comfort, uh, productivity, and also has implications for environmental sustainability. So we'll touch on all of these uh, outcomes from indoor air quality. So we can basically break down the different types of indoor air contaminants into chemical and biological uh, contaminants. So chemical contaminants include uh, sources like building and furnishing materials and include a couple that you may be familiar with, formaldehyde and asbestos. Uh, we'll just touch on a little bit of an update about those. And then also uh, combustion products. Uh, again, tobacco has been a problem for a long time. Uh, most health professionals you know, are aware of the hazards. We'll talk a little bit about some recent developments. And then especially talk a little bit more detail about gas stoves, which have been in the news lately as a source of air pollution and also their environmental uh, ramifications. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, cleaners, personal care products and hobbies as being other factors that could influence indoor air contaminant levels. And then we'll talk about uh, biological hazards a bit. Uh, allergens, it's allergy season right now, and many people are aware uh, about pollen, currently tree pollen, but other uh, allergens that may be present indoors from both indoor and outdoor sources. And then indoor sources, of course, uh, one of the major ones is mold. And then talk a little bit about infectious disease ages, which have been an item of concern over the last several years, uh, especially with COVID, but also other uh, agents that are transmissible by uh, air, by airborne uh, transmission. So I like to uh, try to conceptualize the complexity of indoor air uh, quality and indoor air pollution by thinking about the things that are inside, we hope that they get out when there are air contaminants in the air. So we want to increase ventilation to get rid of uh, things that are in the air, uh, toxic things or other air pollutants in the air. Uh, and then when they're outside, we wanna try to keep them from getting in. Uh, and we have to make an effort to do both of these things because there is some buildings do breathe, there's movement indoors and outdoors, but to sort of enhance ventilation when, when we wanna enhance it or to decrease ventilation when there's an outdoor source, like say smoke from a, a wildfire, where we might want to try to reduce, close our windows and so on. Um, we have to be aware of how that influences indoor air uh, quality. 
Uh, so, uh, and it's not generally recognized, I don't think, that uh, buildings do breathe quite a bit, that typically a home exchanges all the air inside with the outside, uh, about uh, uh, two volumes of the indoor air, what we call air exchange rate, uh, per hour, uh, anywhere from about uh, half to maybe about two per hour without any mechanical ventilation, just through little cracks um, between, uh, you know, obviously windows and doors, but also other places, uh, electrical outlets and uh, dryer vents and uh, many other places where it can move in, inside and outside. This little figure that uh, I created a few years ago about how people are exposed to air pollution indoors, uh, showing how uh, air pollutants come indoors and then they react and then they can deposit on surfaces and then there are indoor sources as well. So just trying to illustrate how complex it can be before people actually may breathe what's in the air. So there are many agents, many sources, and many factors. And then these agents, sources, factors can change over time, and sometimes predictably and sometimes unexpectedly. So it's a very complex and dynamic circumstance. Uh, and it depends not only on the conditions you know, in, indoors, but also occupant activities, things like cooking, which again, we'll talk about a bit, uh, cleaning, uh, hobbies, uh, and then during construction or renovation, we can have uh, special conditions that can uh, influence air quality. And then uh, the seasonal effects. So in heating and cooling season, generally ventilation increases. Uh, and then uh, biological sources, though, have their own season as well. Um, dust mites are uh, more prevalent when it's moist. So in the, in the winter, when the air is dry, uh, typically lower, for example, for dust mite allergy. And then we have, uh, again, infiltration from outdoors and then the, the importance of ventilation. I think you could say about uh, indoor air quality, uh, sort of like the real estate thing about location, location, location. For indoor air quality, it's ventilation, 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 in terms of preventing and maintaining a good air quality. So we can break down, again, as a sort of a framework uh, to organize you know, all these various sorts of um, uh, air, air pollutants, indoor air pollutants, and then their health effects. We can break down the health effects also into, for physical effects, uh, toxicological, immune, or infectious um, infection. Uh, effects that we can have. Um, so the toxicological can be like irritation or asthma exacerbation or for like particulate matter, there are associations, causal associations with increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Um, for chronic health effects from the toxicological effects of indoor air pollutants, uh, we may have a new onset asthma, more chronic heart disease, uh, some indoor air pollutants, we'll touch on a few, are carcinogens. Uh, there's endocrine disruption, neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative effects that have been noted, and, and many other sort of chronic effects. Uh, but then we have, also have to keep in mind that people have psychological and social responses to a poor indoor air quality. So uh, distress and discomfort are uh, often a company uh, being in an indoor environment where uh, there's air contaminants uh, and that can then decrease people's productivity. Uh, and there are some conditions which uh, we'll touch on that um, are more related to these sort of responses to the stress and distress. But we always have to keep in mind, and you know, when I see patients, I often, have to deal with this mind-body continuum uh, that people have physical responses, but then they also have psychological and social responses, uh, which can occur at work, can occur at home, uh, and which can either um, uh, facilitate you know, resolution or improvement, or they can potentially exacerbate uh, the, the health effects in terms of the physical effects of, of an exposure indoors. So here, I think it's important to make a distinction between a sick building syndrome, which we may be familiar with, and 
building related illness. Uh, so sick building syndrome is really sort of more about the building and the symptoms that people have uh, when they experience sick building syndrome are generally nonspecific. They're multi-organ system. They don't fit a clear pattern of something like say asthma or allergy. Uh, again, often headache, nausea, fatigue, uh, itchy, watery eyes that may be distinct from, again, allergy. Uh, and then they're hard to uh, trace to a specific source. And then they improve quickly and went away from the building. So really the association is with the building. And then th there's really uh, no tests that can rule in a specific condition. And usually those sort of conditions have been ruled out. Uh, whereas in contrast, building-related illness uh, is very specific in terms of its symptoms um, to a particular uh, disease. So again, it'll be itchy, watery eyes, runny nose, um, nasal congestion during the season when people are having allergy or when there's an allergen you know, present. Uh, and then these sort of symptoms, again, say asthma, for example, uh, occur when away from work, uh, away from the building, whether again, whether it's home or at work. Um, and then we can also often uh, use specific tests to rule in a specific condition uh, for building-related illness. So, so the real challenge often is more with the, the sick building syndrome or uh, non-specific symptoms that people have. Uh, but then we, you know, look for air contaminants and we look for ways to explain uh, those symptoms. It's often very challenging um, in the case of sick building syndrome. Uh, but then, you know, we do have specific indoor air contaminants that we're concerned about. And the question is because, you know, there are many different air contaminants and often uh, the levels of various air contaminants, things, for example, that we call air toxics, uh, chemicals that are uh, toxic, are often found at higher levels indoors than outdoors. Uh, so chemicals like benzene, perhaps formaldehyde, uh, and, and many others. Uh, when we do testing indoors, we often find that the levels are higher than outdoors. Uh, so a question is, you know, uh, how much is too much? Uh, and you may be familiar with the dictum of Paracelsus, uh, that the dose makes the poison, that uh, any substance in a low enough dose uh, should not be toxic. Any substance in a sufficiently high dose uh, is toxic. But the challenge that we have uh, with uh, indoor air quality is generally that there's a lack of standards for indoor air quality. We have occupational uh, health standards for various chemicals, but those are generally really often practically too high for application in homes and offices. Uh, they're often based on what industrial workers will tolerate. Uh, and and the, you may have a double standard, we may consider that maybe that's not appropriate, but, but generally um, those are not very useful for indoor air circumstances. Uh, and then we have environmental standards, uh, but those are typically like reference doses or reference concentrations that are based on chronic exposure with a lot of uncertainty factors and often from animal toxicology. And then often, practically speaking, they may be too low uh, for application um, in, in indoor uh, spaces. Um, so, it's a, so it's a challenge. Uh, a lot of it's a practical management. How do we uh, help people um, in terms of management in buildings as well as uh, homeowners and others who may be affected? Uh, and then people can also have individual uh, sort of thresholds of response. Uh, so with allergy, for example, uh, it's often uh, challenging to know what the threshold is. For many people respond to very low levels of an allergen, and that can vary from one person to another. Uh, and then for chemicals, uh, there's a, there are conditions that people have chemical sensitivity or idiopathic environmental intolerance, which um, are challenging uh, in terms of uh, understanding uh, how to control the exposure sufficiently, uh, and also the mechanism by which people have those uh, conditions. Uh, but generally, again, it is a problem that uh, we need to deal with, um, whether we can explain it or not, and that 
um, requires, again, a sensitivity on the per part of the uh, practitioner to understand uh, various factors that may be involved and try to, to come up with practical solutions for uh, reducing uh, the exposure and hopefully managing the condition. So I want to talk about a few specific uh, in indoor air chemical exposures. Uh, so the first is one that we're all probably pretty familiar with, which is carbon monoxide uh, and carbon monoxide poisoning. From incomplete uh, combustion, uh, you know, complete combustion of hydrocarbons should produce carbon dioxide. Uh, but so when the flames aren't burning properly or they're not, and especially not properly vented, we get more carbon monoxide uh, formed. And this can occur, especially with space heaters that aren't vented, uh, gasoline engines from uh, generators, electrical generators, or people perhaps idling, warming up the car in the garage, perhaps. Uh, and uh, carbon monoxide is odorless and colorless. People don't know when they're being exposed. And then it can cause uh, illness ranging from headache to drowsiness to unconsciousness and, and death. And, and it's still a major problem. So each year, uh, greater than 400 people uh, die of carbon monoxide poisoning in the United States. Uh, there's over 100,000 emergency department visits every year. And it's entirely preventable through awareness and maintenance of appliances and carbon monoxide alarms as a secondary uh, prevention. Another incomplete combustion product that we're all familiar with is uh, environmental tobacco smoke. Uh, and an important point here is that it's been recognized in recent, more recent years that even in apartments or other areas of multi-unit buildings, where people aren't smoking, if there are people smoking elsewhere in the building, then everyone may be exposed. And we all know the, the health hazards of uh, tobacco, which extend from primary mainstream uh, tobacco smoke to environmental tobacco smoke. Uh, and then especially concerns about childhood asthma exacerbation and respiratory infections, ear infections, sudden infant death syndrome, all of which have been causally uh, connected to environmental tobacco smoke. And then we have some uh, more recent concerns related to marijuana and vaping uh, as well. Things have improved over time. Uh, this uh, figure shows that back before 1990, uh, about 90% of uh, US population was um, estimated to be exposed to secondhand tobacco smoke either at home or at work. Uh, and that's declined to 25% in this recent survey up to the year 2014. And I'm sure that's been improving more. Uh, the uh, HUD back, it was, I think it was 2019, uh, mandated that, uh, well, prohibited smoking, uh, banned smoking in uh, HUD housing, public housing, uh, back, I believe it was 2019, that was challenged in court and recently upheld by a federal court. So that should be improving in terms of the overall exposure to environmental tobacco smoke. So now a topic that's recently been in the news in the last few months uh, has been a putative uh, effort by the U.S. Uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission to ban uh, gas stoves. Uh, and this has been a little bit of, uh, I think, misinterpretation and created a sort of a political bit of a firestorm um, that started uh, when actually a, a group of senators and, and Congress people, uh, 20 uh, signatories on a letter to the Consumer Product Safety Commission asking the commission to look at the health and environmental impacts of gas stoves and then one of the commissioners shortly after that, I think the letter was back in December, one of the commissioners uh, uh, in an interview said that uh, the health hazards from gas stoves was a hidden hazard and any uh, option is on the table and that products that can't be made safe can be banned. And certainly that's, that's within the authority of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, but it, it was quickly the, uh, the head of the commission uh, quickly said that they had no intention of banning and that they were looking, they're just looking at the hazards. They, they you know, weren't um, 
looking for they're looking for information and not acting. Um, so what's but yeah, so that did lead to a lot of stories in the news, uh, you know, taking away our gas stoves or um, you know, quite uh, politicized. And here's the letter uh, from um, the uh, senators and congressmen that uh, back in December, uh, which just you know really asked them to look at the health and environmental uh, impacts and provided some of the uh, basis, uh, recent uh, academic uh, papers and studies, which I'm going to review. So, so uh, you know, when, we, when we burn anything, uh, basically, we're going to have combustion products, and depending on how complete the combustion is, or depending on and depending on what's burning, uh, we're going to have various sorts of uh, air pollutants that are formed. So gas stoves so generally, you know, we think they're very clean burning, uh, but actually the, the heat from the, 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 the flame uh, can actually uh, cause reactions between nitrogen and oxygen that are you know, present in the air. Uh, and the nitrogen, which is usually very inert and doesn't react, but at very high temperatures can actually uh, combust with oxygen to form first nitric oxide, and then the nitric oxide then is very reactive and reacts with oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide. So we have nitrogen dioxide uh, formed. Uh, this also is from car uh, gasoline engines and uh, diesel engines and other burning as well forms nitrogen dioxide. Uh, but then also, so stoves also produce, as we know from experience, uh, smoke and other particles. Uh, especially ultra-fine uh, particles from the gas, as well as from the other burning uh, things that we're cooking often. Um, and then there's other concerns with uh, stoves that include the fact that uh, natural gas itself is primarily methane, and that, that methane is a greenhouse gas, and it's a particularly short-lived greenhouse gas, so that um, the increase in methane, or decrease if we were to use gas less and release less methane into the atmosphere can actually have uh, more immediate uh, impacts, favorable impacts in that case, you know, on uh, global uh, climate change. And then there's also the CO2 that's formed from, from burning uh, natural gas. Uh, so this, uh, there's a couple of papers that um, sort of precipitated or initiated uh, concerns uh, among the senators and others uh, so in earlier in 2022, this is a paper from Environmental Science and Technology that did a study of gas stoves showing that uh, here in this figure that even with the uh, stove off, there's leakage of, of uh, natural gas, methane, uh, and that because most of the time the stove is off, the total amount of methane that's released is uh, mostly coming from release when the stove is not even being used. And then when it is turned on, there's uh, you know, a rapid increase uh, in the amount of methane uh, release, but that's very short term. And then you know, the gas is being burned. Um, and then uh, we see from the green line in this figure that uh, there's no nitrogen dioxide you know, produced by the stove until it's turned on and until the flame starts. Uh, but then there's a rapid increase and that that increase in nitrogen dioxide can easily exceed the, the US EPA standard for nitrogen dioxide, the one hour standard for uh, outdoor air pollution, not meant to be applied necessarily indoors, but to give you some sense that these can be substantial amounts of NO2. Uh, and then uh, sh uh, about the same time, there was a paper that looks at some earlier results from a meta-analysis in 2013 about uh, studies, uh, you know, a meta-analysis that summarized studies that had looked at associations between uh, gas stove use or nitrogen dioxide exposure and asthma exacerbation. And looking at the gas stove use epidemiology and then doing calculations based on the proportion of children with asthma living in homes with gas stoves. And it's about 35% of homes across the country that have uh, natural gas uh, stoves. 
uh, they overall across the country attributed 13% of current asthma, childhood asthma in the United States to uh, gas stove use. Uh, and this figure shows how it varied from state to state. Uh, New York was about 19%. Again, the, the idea that um, without gas stoves, uh, perhaps 19% of asthma could have been uh, prevented. Uh, but that was based on some earlier results, again, from this meta-analysis that goes back to 2013. So concerns about uh, gas stove emissions and asthma is not anything really new. Uh, there's been concerns going back to at least the 1980s, 1990s, where some of these studies, uh, 1970s here, if you look at some of the studies here with gas cooking and asthma. So this is a forest plot, which if you're not familiar, uh, gives results of all these individual studies. And then uh, the vertical line, uh, which corresponds to number one, uh, down there on the bottom at the x-axis, that's like no effect. And then uh, these horizontal lines have a point estimate, the, uh, the dot on the line, and then the 95% composite interval for each one of these studies. And you can see that you know some had actually protective effects, at least according to the point estimate, uh, where the, the dots on the left of the vertical line. But then you know, many of them uh, showed increased risk. Many of them not statistically significant if that horizontal line you know, crosses the vertical line. And a lot of heterogeneity, so lots of uh, variability from one study to another. But then the uh, aggregate estimate is the, the diamond there, uh, which if that doesn't cross the vertical line, that's statistically significant. So showing here, statistically significant increase of about actually 42%. Um, if you follow that line down, uh, it's like 1.4 approximately, which would be a 40% increase um, with uh, gas cooking, 40% uh, increased risk of having current asthma uh, among children. Uh, and then uh, if we look at nitrogen dioxide, and there's relatively fewer studies that have actually measured you know, nitrogen dioxide, we don't see that increase, but these confidence intervals you know, for the, the diamonds there, as you can see, are quite a bit wider than the confident intervals here. And so we can see that um, you know, there's not clear evidence that nitrogen dioxide is responsible. And again, um, gas stoves produce a lot of ultrafine particles as well as uh, other uh, air pollutants besides nitrogen dioxide. Uh, so this, uh, other studies uh, have looked at wheezing rather than uh, asthma diagnosis. So, you know, you can ask uh, parents about wheezing um, uh, to get an asthma diagnosis not, uh, is often more challenging. Um, so gas cooking was not, cons uh, in this meta-analysis, was not associated with uh, wheezing. Um, and then also for nitrogen dioxide, uh, there was um, an increase in the risk of current wheeze, which is the, the, the top set here of uh, results. And then uh, the studies at the bottom were for a lifetime wheeze, again, very few studies, but uh, at the bottom, lifetime wheeze was not statistically significant. So again, so a very mixed picture as to um, gas stoves themselves, certainly they, they seem to be associated with increased risk of asthma, but whether it's nitrogen dioxide or other uh, substances or other exposures uh, from gas cooking is not clear. Or, or there's some differences between homes that have gas cooking and those that don't, that may be potential confounders of that relationship. Um, so there have been some studies looking at whether or not we can intervene. And then these studies also give uh, some sense of uh, what the key components are in terms of what the causal components are. So in this case, uh, this was a study of home interventions for uh, decreasing indoor nitrogen dioxide uh, concentrations in homes with uh, gas stoves, where uh, they actually installed a, a hood over the you know, range hood over the, the stove. Uh, 
or they replace the stove with a non-gas stove, an electric uh, stove, or uh, they use the air filter, which had both a particle filter and a carbon uh, filter for nitrogen uh, oxides. Uh, and we can see here that with a dotted line, just putting in, and, and so you know, it shows that baseline, shows one week and then three months later, NO2 concentrations. And so for uh, starting off with the, the, the uh, dotted line, uh, the ventilation hood, actually exposures to nitrogen dioxide actually increased. Uh, but that, they didn't measure uh, whether or not people actually use the hood. And it's unclear like why there'd be a, a, an increase uh, in nitrogen dioxide measurement. Um, but for the other two uh, interventions, for the air purifier and for the uh, stove replacement, especially the stove replacement, there was a clear decrease of about 50% in nitrogen dioxide levels. Um, and it, so even with this stove, there's nitrogen dioxide in the air inside homes from outdoors. It's an outdoor air pollutant. Again, it comes from cars and trucks and buses and so on. Um, so, then they, so then they also um, looked in the bedroom and also you know, found that there was a decrease with the, the um, stove replacement, but the other interventions not very effective. Um, and, and again, so this um, you know, isn't looking at as outcomes, just looking to see whether or not we can decrease levels of exposure. Um, and so, so the, it's somewhat of a mixed picture, but certainly a concern that uh, emissions from gas stoves are uh, a likely causal factor in, in asthma, in asthma exacerbation and in causing asthma. Uh, and there are other concerns related to, again, the methane as well as CO2 emissions. Um, so moving on to uh, other uh, chemicals in the air inside homes. Uh, formaldehyde is something that uh, has been a concern for quite some time uh, also. Uh, it's a volatile organic compound that's been used a lot uh, in uh, manufactured wood products, uh, particle board, um, plywood. Uh, it's also used in paints and other coatings and adhesives uh, and in urea formaldehyde foam insulation. Uh, and then these materials can then tend to off gas over time and contribute formaldehyde uh, levels in, in the air. Uh, formaldehyde is a carcinogen, formaldehyde is an irritant, formaldehyde probably some concentrations would exacerbate uh, asthma. Um, so the question again is how much is too much? Uh, formaldehyde is also present in outdoor air, uh, comes indoors from outdoors as well. Uh, and there's been uh, regulation as well as uh, more, I think, um, manufacturing, uh, manufacturers voluntarily reducing the amount of formaldehyde in materials and then a lot of attention, so green building materials are using less uh, of these uh, manufactured wood products. Asbestos, again, something that's been around for a long period of time and used a lot so over uh, many centuries that uh, has many wonderful uh, properties in terms of uh, usefulness uh, and then was widely used uh, in the 20th century as insulation, but also um, shingles and other building materials, and as well as consumer products like ironing boards and brake pads, uh, these uh, fibrous materials that are easily divisible into smaller, smaller fibers that then can get, become airborne, associated with lung cancer and mesothelioma, uh, and at high levels, asbestosis, uh, the concern with indoor air exposure at relatively low levels is, has typically been that there may be an increased risk of mesothelioma. Uh, certainly levels can get quite a bit higher when there's uh, remediation that's done, perhaps inappropriately. Uh, there's still a lot of asbestos in buildings. Uh, generally, if it's in good condition and not friable, uh, meaning that it can be a, if it's not friable, it can't be easily uh, crushed with hand, hand pressure. Uh, 
But if it is friable and it is disturbed, uh, it can easily get into the air. Uh, and it's, again, widely been used in pipe insulation, other insulation, uh, not since the 19, uh, not prior to about 1970 or so, it was used, but not really since then, but there's still opportunities for exposure because it is present uh, so uh, widely. Uh, but again, if it's in good condition, it can be maintained in place. Uh, the problem is that, you know, on, on piping, for example, it can easily become uh, damaged and then lead to potential exposure. Something to be aware of. Um, another uh, common indoor air pollutant uh, that's a concern for health here in New Jersey is radon. Uh, this uh, Here's a radon map. Uh, this radon comes from radium, which is naturally occurring uh, in rock uh, in New Jersey, in various, really throughout the state. Although um, in much higher uh, likelihood uh, and potential in the areas marked in red on this map, and then moderate in green and low radon potential in, in blue. Uh, so uh, radium in the Earth's crust uh, decays to radon, which is a gas, which uh, then also has further decay that releases alpha and beta radiation. And if it does that inside our lungs, it can be very damaging and cause lung cancer. And so radon across the United States is the second leading cause of uh, lung cancer. And again, a concern in uh, especially the, those areas marked in red here on the map, but also in those areas marked in green. Um, radon has been tested during real estate transactions and uh, it can then lead to remediation. Uh, there's another source of uh, indoor air pollution that comes up from the ground into our homes, and that's vapor intrusion, uh, which uh, actually in, uh, by a mechanism or by a uh, pathway that's similar to radon, uh, when there's uh, volatile organic compounds like gasoline, for example, or other uh, uh, spills or uh, contamination of uh, groundwater, uh, that the uh, organic vapors the, um, from the, uh, the contaminant uh, can then volatilize through the soil particles, just like radon does, comes up through the soil particles, and then can get into homes uh, through any cracks or other openings uh, in the basement or the slab or the crawl space potentially, but especially uh, from basements. So there's a very simple solution to this once if it's recognized. So, you know, so radon is tested and found to be elevated, or if there's problems with vapor intrusion, which uh, often are harder to detect, uh, the solution is a subslab depressurization system, which is essentially a fan that creates a negative pressure underneath the house and prevents the radon from getting into the house, essentially sucking the air out below the house to create a negative pressure. Because um, normally houses are typically a little bit under negative pressure inside, so that actually draws radon and volatile organic compounds when, when it comes to vapor intrusion uh, circumstances uh, into the house. So this you know, reverses that and is very effective. Uh, so. Um, Another uh, class of compounds uh, that are concerning for indoor air pollution are allergens. Uh, so we have allergens of outdoor origin, like pollen and grass and dust mites. Uh, and then we can have indoor uh, allergens, uh, dogs, cats, uh, mice, uh, cockroaches, uh, especially in many urban areas, uh, mold spores uh, that arise indoors and can cause allergy, which I think most of us are familiar with and many of us have, uh, itchy watery eyes, potentially asthma, rash, hives. So we have uh, indoor sources that vary from home to home and place to place that uh, dust mites are pretty ubiquitous everywhere uh, on our bodies, in our bedding. Uh, and then also cockroaches, especially the allergen is in there 
the feces of the cockroach, uh, rats and mice also from the urine. Uh, and then these can become airborne and uh, cause uh, conditions or allergy that we, uh, again, are often pretty familiar with. Um, and a special concern and been a concern over many years now is uh, moisture and mold indoors. And this can be a source of allergy. Uh, again, the mold spores, which are adapted to become airborne. Uh, and everywhere there's a potential uh, source of moisture and it, that's not controlled. And there's a carbon source and uh, just regular indoor temperatures, a uh, mold will grow. It's uh, pretty much inevitable. And then the concern is that mold can cause infections very rarely in immunocompromised people. It's not really a concern uh, for most people. Uh, as I mentioned, can cause allergy. Uh, and then also uh, molds do produce mycotoxins, which are in themselves potentially very hazardous, especially when they're in food. So when they're in food, especially they can uh, cause um, serious conditions like aflatoxin is a carcinogen, for example, found in um, moldy grain and peanuts and other um, agricultural products. But the extent to which mycotoxins that are present in indoor uh, mold uh, growing on indoor surfaces can cause enough exposure to, to get people sick is uh, not clear. There's really no evidence uh, that makes it clear that that can actually happen. Uh, but that's often what people are concerned about uh, because if you look on the internet or if you um, uh, look on billboards <laughs> around uh, many parts of the state, you may find people um, who are um, selling uh, products to uh, you know, reduce exposure to mold or selling services to reduce exposure to mold due to concern about mycotoxins. Um, <clears throat> So the, basically the four categories of health effects of exposure to mold uh, for indoor exposure to mold are allergy, again, infection, very rare, irritation and odors potentially, but certainly odor, a musty odor of mold uh, can certainly be very, uh, can cause physical symptoms. And then the toxicity is not really all that clear. Um, mold can grow in hidden places inside buildings, uh, inside wall cavities, for example, underneath carpeting. And essentially to control it, uh, the key uh, uh, activities, the key actions are to prevent moisture. Uh, and then if there is mold growth, to remove the moldy material. Uh, and then impervious surfaces can be cleaned and it don't need to be necessarily, again, discarded. Um, and generally cleaning is enough. So removing the moldy material and then keeping it from coming back by controlling the moisture uh, and that disinfection generally is not necessary. Mold spores are everywhere. Uh, so really the, in terms of disinfecting to try to, you know, uh, to kill them or take special effort to remove them is not really going to be effective. Um, and it may also cause more problems with the exposure, say to bleach with people, which people may use to try to you know, control mold. All right, so finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about infectious diseases. Uh, and again, uh, especially COVID's been of concern lately, but you know, there are other uh, airborne or potentially airborne uh, infectious diseases, which are also common. Um, when people do sneeze, or now we know, especially with COVID, that there are normal breathing, uh, singing, talking, we release droplets into the air of various sizes. Some of them that are larger, they fall out very quickly within about three feet of uh, when they're released, but others may travel further. This is a figure uh, from early in the pandemic, uh, relatively early, uh, showing a, really a theoretical depiction of how larger uh, droplets that are emitted 
fall out quickly, but smaller ones may travel a distance. And certainly, yes, if there's an airstream and it's moving from this person on the left to the person on the right, you can have a situation like that. This potentially a strong air current, but more likely it's that both the larger and the smaller droplets are in higher concentration near the person who's releasing them. And then they disperse out. Uh, the problem is that if they uh, disperse out and then there's inadequate ventilation that they could build up in the space over time uh, and that that may then expose the other person to the smaller droplets. And even today, uh, they act the exact, uh, or I shouldn't say the exact, but the relative uh, proportion of risk from larger to smaller droplets is not clear. It does seem from some epidemiologic studies that it, at least it's possible that there can be transmission at a distance from these smaller uh, droplets. But again, the key here then is, ventil is ventilation or potentially air cleaning with a filter, which essentially creates clean air by, uh, <clears throat> by uh, filtering the air. So uh, ventilation that brings in clean air from outdoors dilutes air contaminants indoors. And also filtration, which removes contaminants from the indoor air, is essentially also contributing fresh air. Uh, it's called like the clean air delivery rate from a filter, uh, which is essentially acting the same as bringing in fresh air from outdoors. Uh, so a couple of things I wanted to just review <clears throat> real quickly. I think a lot of people now, because of our experience with COVID and uh, discussions about respirators and filters and how they work. Uh, I think there's been a general increase in, in sort of the knowledge about filters, but there's been longstanding misconceptions about filters that uh, because they have a certain pore size, you know, they're fibers, fibrous filters, that the <clears throat> smaller particles uh, can get through. So if a filter is rated for 0.3 microns, it's tested for particles that are 0 0.3 microns and found to be like 99.97% efficient, like a HEPA filter, that, that that means that particles that are smaller than 0.3 microns uh, get through the filter. But that's actually not the case and that uh, these types of filters, fibrous filters, actually are more efficient for removing particles that are smaller uh, and they remove particles by these uh, different mechanisms here. Uh, so it's not like a sieve. It's not like the particle uh, is trapped by not being able to get through an opening. So if you look at this image here, there's many of these particles on this filter that are smaller than those openings uh, between the fibers. And that's because they've been uh, removed or um, deposited by inertial impaction or diffusion. So even very, very small particles uh, can't get through the filter because they're not taking a straight line. They're at the top image there on the right. They're zigzagging uh, because they bounce around in the air. And so filters are more efficient, actually, than, and, and actually the 0 0.3 microns, the least efficiently removed a particle size. And that's shown in this figure here. <clears throat> we have a filter here that it was 99.7% efficient at 0 0.3 microns. But along the bottom axis there is the particle size. And then on the y-axis is the efficiency of the particle removal. So you can see that above and smaller than and as well as larger than the 0.3 microns, <clears throat> there's more, more efficient particle removal. Um, so I haven't talked too much about it, but um, in addition to indoor sources of air pollution, um, of indoor air pollution, there are outdoor sources. So particulate matter and ozone, especially, you know, here in New Jersey, that uh, may be of concern. Uh, and so again, the idea is when there's outdoor levels of air pollution that are elevated, then reducing ventilation and keeping those outdoor air pollutants from getting indoors uh, is important. Uh, but we have to very Cognizant, though, if there are indoor sources, again, like especially environmental tobacco smoke or other sources that may vary from one home to another, 
their, their decreasing ventilation again may not be uh, beneficial. Uh, so just um, you know, in general, the hierarchy of controls in industrial hygiene uh, is applicable to indoor air pollutants. So first eliminating or sub eliminating a source or substituting uh, other materials, engineering controls, which again, primarily ventilation, whether local exhaust ventilation or general ventilation. And then administrative uh, controls, again, um, uh, behaviors, uh, what people do, how they cook, how they uh, you know, uh, use appliances and so on are important. And the personal protective equipment is really not, doesn't really have much of a role uh, for indoor exposures. Again, unless under extreme circumstances like uh, wildfires where there might be high levels of particulate matter, even indoors that infiltrate in those circumstances. Uh, and then just to make the point about ventilation, uh, there's passive ventilation, but then active ventilation as well, which helps us to control uh, indoor air pollutants uh, better. But most homes uh, still have more passive uh, ventilation systems. Um, it's important to have enough fresh air indoors. Uh, there's standards for office buildings, commercial buildings, but again, we don't really have standards for the homes where many people are spending a lot more of their time lately. Uh, some of these systems are quite complex. Um, and there are some that are notorious for having problems like univents, which are often found in schools uh, and other older buildings. Um, there's issues with ventilation systems in terms of uh, their maintenance and the the filters that they have and how efficient they might be. Uh, so when it comes to uh, indoor air quality concerns and complaints, uh, that's something that myself and other uh, health professionals, occupational health professionals often have to deal with in terms of trying to identify what the sources are. And often the symptoms, again, are nonspecific. Um, there can be a lot of other factors involved in terms, again, of uh, psychological and social factors. Um, but generally, you know, we want to look at symptoms. We may do a survey. Walkthrough inspections are, can be especially valuable. Um, then some basic readings like of temperature and humidity, carbon, carbon dioxide levels, which are an indicator of the amount of ventilation, since we're all producing as occupants uh, carbon dioxide. It can be a reasonable indicator. Uh, and then we want to do testing really when it's done for a purpose of testing a hypothesis. So not just to go out and test a bunch of things, but if based on observation or based on the kind of symptoms that people have or the conditions in the building, having some hypothesis about what might be the, the source and then testing you know, for that. Uh, here's some basic information that about Public Employees OSHA here in New Jersey, um, as well as uh, the Department of Health, uh, Indoor Environments, they have a program, as well as there are private industrial hygienists who do these types of evaluations uh, as well. So in summary, you know, we spend 90% of our time indoors, actually more for most people, uh, and a lot of different types of indoor environments. Uh, there are a lot of potential chemical and biological hazards. Uh, present potentially, it's important to be aware of them and then to use a hierarchy of controls type approach with eliminating or substituting uh, and then engineering controls. And again, ventilation, 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 the appropriate ventilation. Um, and then again, having awareness and then seeking professional assistance when needed. So I hopefully we have a few minutes for questions or I can certainly um, respond uh, to any questions in the chat um, by uh, email later. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lombard. We do have a few questions, and I, but I, however, I know that you only have a limited time. So whatever questions Dr. Lombard don't get to get to today, I will definitely send it over to him and then I can share that with you all. Um, the first question that we have here is, are there new regulations for exposure to environmental marijuana exposures in res residential areas? Um, for instance, apartment housing developments. Uh, 
That's not that I'm aware of. That's that's a great question. Uh, I'm not aware of any regulations like that. Okay. Um, is there a way or method to identify sick building? Well, it's really it's really challenging um, because of the non-specificity of the symptoms that people often have. Uh, often, it seems to be a problem with inadequate ventilation. Uh, but again, it varies from one circumstance uh, to another. Sometimes there are specific types of contaminants, but often it's just, you know, what's found generally is that there may be inadequate ventilation. Uh, often there's other factors involved uh, as well um, in terms of um, other work conditions where people are, you know, feeling uncomfortable at work for various, you know, sort of uh, reasons and then there are conditions in the environment that then come together you know with these other factors to make people feel ill thank you um is there is there a release of volatile organics from vaping by use um, by these devices any exposure concern beyond the obvious bad habit yes yeah, so, so well certainly there's the there's the nicotine um you know from the uh the uh, secondhand vaping, as well as there are some uh, toxic substances uh, that are produced in the combustion, you know, which occurs inside the device that can that vary from one, uh, you know, type of product to another. So that is something I think where there's it's an act, active area of research uh, to try to understand that better. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Dr. Lombard, I know that you have to get off. It is 11 a.m. Um, I, I have the questions and I will, I will share those questions with you and again, share it with the attendees. Um, um, just want to thank you so much for taking the time out today to present on such important information. Um, everyone, please look out for the evaluation when you have some time, if you could fill that evaluation out. Um, but again, thank you, Dr. Lombard. Thank you for all those who uh, attended the webinar today. Um, and everybody take great care. Great, thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care.